Well, good morning. Uh, as most of you know who attend here regularly, our partners, Rick has been on his sabbatical. He's here with us today, but don't, don't talk to him. <laughs> Rick, have you run your chainsaw on your sabbatical? Yes. yes. You still have all 10 fingers. He's doing good. He's doing good. So all, all along we've been having different people come up and deliver the message. Uh, while Rick's been on sabbatical, we've had some of our pastors, uh, um, missionaries, and I'm excited about today. Let me tell you about Doug Whitley a little bit. Doug grew up in eastern North Carolina, so we like him very much because of that. And at the age of four, he came to childlike faith um, to Jesus Christ, and he dedicated his life to Christ when he was 11 at a church camp out. That's why youth ministry is important, parents. Doug's experience with Christian drama began in high school when he traveled for three years with a Christian drama team. It was during this time that he saw the impact that drama has on people and its ability to reach souls and change hearts. Doug began his present ministry in August of 1990 and portrays over 20 of the great men of the Bible and preachers of the past. Doug has been a friend of Nags Head Church for many, many years. And this morning, you'll be hearing a sermon from Charles H. Spurgeon, the man whom many consider to be the most prolific speaker in Christian history. Spurgeon often preached up to 10 times a week. He once addressed an audience of 23,000 without using a microphone or any form of electronic amplification. And during his lifetime, Spurgeon is estimated to have preached to over 10 million people. The collected sermons of Spurgeon stand as the largest set of books by a single author, in the history of Christianity. So let's welcome Doug Whitley. I mean, Spurgeon. I'm very honored to be a part of your service this morning. One of the things that was not mentioned in the introduction, perhaps some of you know that I smoke cigars. It is true. Some of my finest sermons have come when my head has been wreathed in the smoke of a good cigar. I'm not certain if it is the cigar that allows me to concentrate or the smoke that drives everyone else on the building that allows me to concentrate, but there it is. A layman was chiding me about it. He said, Mr. Spurgeon, I, he was a Methodist, by the way. I do not believe that you should smoke cigars. I said, my dear friend, I will stop smoking when I begin to smoke to excess. He said, what will you consider excessive, Mr. Spurgeon? I said, I would consider it excessive if I were to smoke two cigars at the very same time. <laughs> but there was a day when I was walking the streets of London and I saw an advertisement painted upon the side of a building and it named my particular brand of cigar. The cigar that Spurgeon smokes. A brother has mentioned the number of people to whom I have spoken. My sermons are translated into nearly every language in the world. The sun literally does not set upon our ministry. And so as I saw my name linked with a product, I thought I would not have my name linked with any other name other than Jesus Christ. And so I laid my cigars down, and from that day until now, I have not picked them up again. You need not worry that I will light one here in the pulpit. This morning as we come to the scriptures, I know that this is a time when your church gives you their plan for the future. And so the topic of our sermon this morning is God's will about the future. If you have your scriptures and you would turn to the book of James chapter 4, What a glorious book is the book of James, a transitional book between the Old Testament and the New. The first book written in the New Testament. Written by the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, the half-brother if you will. And so the scripture tells us, James tells us here. In verse 13, go to now ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even as a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For what ye ought to say, 
if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now we rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. We have not changed in these many thousand years. We do exactly the same thing. These people at this time had made plans, and there is no regard to God in them. James sets these words in such a way that they are indeed boasting. He says to them, this is what you do without regard to God. You say, we're going to do this. We're going to go. We're going to buy. We're going to sell. We're going to get gain. We're going to be in such and such a city. Let me assure you that God knows the end even from the beginning. Let us and yes, we should have plans. That is why you're having this time of meeting together today, so that you can plan. But to plan without God is to vaunt ourselves above God. And so let us come to the Scriptures and understand what the, James is trying to teach us through them. Life is uncertain, but not to God. God knows the end from the beginning. And so I'm going to attempt to speak on how we should behave in regard to the future. I'm going to draw some lessons that I hope will be for our own correction and instruction in the verses before us. First, let us notice this. Counting on the future is folly. Counting on the future is folly. And then let's observe what should be clear to all of us. Ignorance of the future is a matter of fact. Someone who tells you they know what is going to happen is lying to you. Whatever prognostication method they may use, please understand that God has not whispered the future in their ears. There is no alignment of the stars. There is no prognostication that can tell us because the future is not revealed to us. And so ignorance of the future is a matter of fact. Thirdly, we shall set before you the truth of this passage that recognition of God in the future is the essence of wisdom. And fourthly, boasting in the future is sin. It is presumption upon the will of God. And the final thought this morning is that using the present is our duty. So let us begin. Counting on the future is folly. The apostle says, go to now, or what are you thinking, as it were? How ridiculous is your conduct? Go to now. You who say, today or tomorrow we will do such and such a thing. There is almost a touch of sarcasm, as it were, in the words. We are frail. We are feeble. And for us to proudly offer up our future and to forget God is so preposterous, so enormous in our folly that he says, go to now. What are you thinking? And let us recognize what these people were doing in the future, in relationship to the future. That is full of the test text is full of suggestion upon this matter. You see, they believed, they thought, they acted as if their own time was at their own disposal. Our time is not. They say, we will go, we will continue, we will buy, we will sell, we will gain. Or if they, you rather make it more personally, I will do this, I will go, I will sell, I will buy, I will get gain that everything is going to fall out exactly as you have envisioned, exactly as you have desired, without God, God's consent. The idea that we can make up our minds, that we can somehow project what is going to happen, and that will make it so. How dreadful is it for us to self-govern our lives and our time? Because you see, there is a God. And he governs. There is a higher power. And if you do not understand this, 
that is the very essence of wisdom. It is the first letter in the alphabet of wisdom, if you will, that God disposes of our days, that the Lord reigns, that He rules, that He knows the end even from the beginning, that before we were formed in our mother's womb, He knew our essence. Psalm 139 tells us he knows when we sit down, when we stand up. He knows the words before they leave our lips. That is very specific, is it not? That is exactly how much God knows about us, everything. And what he knows that we do not is our future. <coughs> and so let us understand, they recognized that everything was at dis their disposal and they seemed to use everything toward a worldly object. Did they determine with each other, well, we're going to do this or we're going to do that? What do you think? No, there is no questioning there of what someone else thinks. We will do today. We will do tomorrow. But they did not say we will do such a thing for the glory of God and for his kingdom. There is not a word of God in it. And my beloved, we must, whatever plans we make, come to the word of God. Come to the thoughts of God. Come to what God would have for us and yield whatever our plans might be to God himself. How men are so today, even as they were then. Men have not changed since the fall of Adam. They say, we're going to go to this place. We're going to sell it a profit. We will get gain. You see, their first and only thought was what they were going to do. <coughs> How it would affect them. That they might get sufficient goods to make them feel rich. The highest ambition on their minds was the accumulation of wealth. Are there not many in our world today who live exactly the same way? They believe they can map out their own lives. They believe that they can think or objectify whatever it might be that they want, and that's going to make it happen. And so it is to gain honor, or to gain wealth, or to gain fame, or to gain pleasure. And the heart rises not into the serene air of heavenly vision of God himself. And that is how these people spoke. We will, we will, we will. Not he will. There is no implication here of divine blessing. There is no implication here of divine entreaty. They did not seek out God's will. They did not seek out his leading. They did not care for any of that. They were self-contained. They called themselves self-made men. What a glorious thought. We would say, oh, he is a self-made man, as if that is a good thing. When we begin to reckon our future without a shadow of doubt, because of our own ability, our brains, our work, our brawn, whatever it might be, our own self-confidence, when we do these things without regard to God, we are destined to failure. Because we forget, as the scripture tells us, the arrow that flieth by day. We forget the deadly pestilence that walks in darkness. And people are overwhelmed with eternal ruin because they have not consulted God. They have acted and they have planned and they have foreseen without God's intervention. How did they know they were going to get there? How did they know what was going to happen? Do they regulate the markets? Will there be no fall in prices? No, none of these things entered into their thinking. None of these things occasionally into our, into, into our thinking. Because we think we are certain what I have said will make it so. And if I said to them, but all men die. Oh yes, yes, I know. All men die. All men come to that end. But not me. <laughs> you see, that is how we operate. I believe we may judge them by what they were apart from the grace of God. That is a saying, all men count all men mortal but themselves. Without any saving clause, they say, we will do this, we will continue that a year. How did they know what the year would bring? How did they know that they would not go ill? How did they not know that they would not be injured? How did they not know that all things would change? That there would be a pestilence, an invasion, a fire? And so let us see, <coughs> excuse me, 
excuse me, that looking at this form of folly is counting on the future, and let us speak of the folly itself. You see, it is a great folly to build our hope on that which will never come. It is unwise indeed to count your chickens before they are hatched. It is madness to risk everything on an unsubstantiated future because we do not know what will be on the morrow. It has become a proverb to expect the unexpected. And how often the very thing that we did not count on happening has indeed happened. Because we are frail and our lives are short. So let us understand counting on the folly of the future is folly. But let us come into the house of prayer. Let us recognize what is going to happen. You see, there comes into our lives fogs, there comes into our lives the unexpected. And then the sun comes out and everything looks glorious. Such is our life. There are times when it is bright, there are times when it is glorious, but there are times when we are in the fog in a painted cloud. But we must understand that God is it all and in all. That only His promises and our planning upon the foundation of God itself makes us understand that they are the eternal mansions. Do not reckon upon the future. Do not discount the days to come. Do not plan without bringing God into the equation. Count not on longevity of life. Secondly, let us understand that ignorance of the future is a matter of fact. Whatever we may say, whatever we say about what we mean to do, whatever plans that we may make, let us understand that the Spirit of God speaks truly when He says to every one of us, you do not know what shall be on the morrow. It may be health, it may be prosperity, it may be adversity, it may be sickness, we cannot tell. Tomorrow may mark the end of our lives. Today may mark the end of our lives. Even the end of the age. You see, our ignorance of the future is indeed a fact. Only God knows the future. All things, all time is present to Him. There is no past, no future in his all-seeing eye. He dwells in the present tense forevermore. He is the great I am. Not I was. Not even I shall be. I am. Because he knows what will be on the morrow. He alone knows. My beloved, you must understand, you must comprehend the entire course of the universe. All that there is Every person, every place, every animal, everything is within the purview of the Lord God Almighty. That He knows the end even from the beginning. There are two certainties. One, God knows. Two, we do not. Knowledge of the future is hidden to us. I believe it is perilous, I believe it is wicked, it is sin to attempt to lift even a corner of the veil that hides us from the future. Yes, search into the things that are revealed in Scripture. Sir, know them as far as you can, but do not be foolish as so to think that any man or woman can tell you what is going to happen tomorrow. But they will certainly be happy to take your money for doing so. Let us understand, we can never have the foresight to say, this is clear, I can predict. My beloved, it cannot be. It cannot be. Ignorance of the future is a matter of fact. The poet has written, my God, I would not long to see my fate with curious eyes. What gloomy lines are writ for me, or what bright lines arise. Let it be sufficient for us that our heavenly Father knows. My beloved, please understand. God created this world. God made Adam and Eve in his image. God knew they would fail. 
God knew that he would send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. God knows the end from the beginning. God has made the way of salvation available to us. Why is it that we are willing to trust him with everything about our salvation? But we are not willing to trust him with everything about our future. What shall overtake us if we do not recognize that we cannot know the future? We should be humbled by our ignorance. We should be humbled by His knowledge. Because we do not know what shall be on the morrow. We make these calculations. We are certain this is going to be the way it is. We arrange things so that certain events will come together. But when we do so without God, let us understand. It is better for us to bow low before the throne of God than to stand up and plume ourselves about our plans and accomplishments. We must not plan without reckoning with God. Life is short. God knows the future. He is in control of what shall come. He rules and he reigns in the hearts of men. Now let us come here for those who are in the world of wilderness who count ourselves pilgrims hurrying through it for we are. The third point. Recognition of God with regard to the future is true wisdom. This is what the text says. What ye ought to say if The Lord wills we shall live and do this or that. And I do not believe that we should put in every letter, in every handbill, every statement, the Lord wills, and yet I wish we would do so oftener, that we should use those very words. There is a Latin term, Deo Valente, DV, it is abbreviated, God willing. (laughs) Oh, my beloved Let us live our lives, make our plans always with this, God willing. If the Lord wills, we will do this or that. And even if we do not say it, let us have it in our minds. I may make these plans, but God is in control. Let us live our lives as if these words were the encircling principle, the parenthesis, if you will, of everything we do. Let us understand, if the Lord wills, let us be circumspect, if the Lord wills. My beloved, please understand, will there be difficulties in our lives? Yes. Will there be pain? Yes. Sorrow? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Turmoil? Yes. But my beloved, if we recognize that all of these things that come into our lives, God will indeed make for His honor and glory and for our greatest good. Do we plan to be sick? No. Injured? No. Loss? No. There is a story, if I might make a moment of digression. It's from a Presbyterian pastor, George MacDonald, who was a great writer, is a great writer. He has a story at the back of the North Wind. I would recommend it to you. In it, there is a young man, his name is Diamond. And he meets the North Wind. And the North Wind takes him on wondrous adventures. And glorious things occur. And then there comes a time when the north wind comes and brings to him an adventure. And the young boy in questioning, he's looking out at the sea. There is a ship that is about to sink. It is overcome by the waves. And the young boy says to the north north wind, will the ship sink? And the north wind says, yes. Will lives be lost? Yes. Property lost? Yes. How can you do such a thing? 
And the north wind's response to this is, because I do the will of the one who sent me. And the God who had brought about all of the good things that the young man had witnessed is also the God that brought about the sinking of the ship and the loss of life and property because that was ultimately for their good. And as you read the rest of the story, you, you know how that comes out. That is a story. And you can read it to the end. Our lives are a story, and, but we cannot read them to the end. But understand this. The very essence of understanding the future is to understand that God loves us. That he has for us his, our greatest good for his honor and glory. I believe that nothing happens apart from divine inter intervention and decree. Even the little things of life are not overlooked in the all-seeing eye of God. He tells us the very hairs of our head are numbered. How minuscule is that? The station of a rush of a river is as fixed and foreknown by the station as the station of a king. The chaff from the hand of the winnower is steered as much as the stars in their courses. All things are under regulation and have appointment and place in God's plan. And nothing happens but what he permits or ordains. You are not really comfortable with that, I see. Because we have the eternal why. Job also asked why. And demanded that God explain it to him. How vain for us to demand of God his explanation. Whatever our purpose might be. Understand that God is in control. He permits he ordains, he knows. If the Lord wills, and in saying that, we bow whatever intention we may have, whatever plans we may have, to the Lord God Almighty, the all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing God who knows the end from the beginning. And so let us say, I will do this or that, provided that I can see it is consistent with the Word of God. I will do this or that, provided it is found in Scripture, not to be disobedient. And so to be in quite accordance with the word, I reverence, I must always put in this clause in my thinking, <coughs> in my thinking even if not in my words. I will do this or that if it is the Lord's will, if it is right to do that, if it is God's will to do that, if it is within the providence of God to do this. And with that guidance that comes to us, a peace of the circumstances that surround us. To understand that He guides us. Perhaps there are two courses that are equally right. When judged by the Word of God and you are uncertain, then He will show you or not if they are both right. But let us kneel down. Let us lift our hearts to heaven. Let us ask the Father, what would you have me do? And whenever these purposes are what we should do and we make some purpose, because I do believe we should make plans, we're not to be without forethought. We're not to be without prudence. That is why your elders are coming before you today. Perhaps the God's answer is wait. Be patient. Wait upon the Lord. If I go or if I stay, if I ascend or if I descend, it is the Lord's will and the Lord's will be done whether I live or whether I die. That whatever we might do, whatever our plans might be, they must be taken with reference to God's will. And let us say, fourthly, that boasting about the future is evil. These men here were acting as if it was already done. We're going to do this. We're going to cover ourselves with glory. And the scripture tells us all such rejoicing is evil. If you say, I'm going to do this, the thing is certain, it shall be done. And you do not take reference to God. How foolish. How foolish. In what you have done. All such boasting about the future is evil. I do not have time this morning. Let us come to our present time. Our fifth point. 
The most practical point, using the present is our duty. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. If we know what we ought to do and we do not do it, that is sin. This does not refer to men who live in guilty knowledge, knowledge of duty, and they neglect it. No, this is those who do not take into account God's will. It is sinful to defer obedience to the gospel. It is sinful to defer repentance. It is sinful to defer obedience to Scripture. It is sinful not to seize the day that God has given to you in living a life of obedience and sharing the gospel with others and living your life in such a way as to bring honor and glory to Him. If we could be quiet enough to hear the clock tick, it is saying to us, now, 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 now. And as we hear that clock, <clears throat> it resembles the call of God to the daily duties to, of the hour, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And so, my beloved, as I close this morning, let me assure you, we cannot know the future. But we can know the one who knows the future. We can indeed cast every care upon him. We can indeed trust completely in him. We may claim his promise that I will never leave you nor forsake you. We may rest assured in his glorious promise that my thoughts of you are more in number than the sands upon the seashore. We may indeed bring all of these things together and recognize that God is sovereign, that God is in control, that God has us in his hand. And my beloved, another glorious truth is that when we are in God's hands, he shall never let us go. May God grant his blessing upon the preaching of his word. Please, if you would remain silent as... Others come to close our time this morning. The things that are being shared with you, thank you for the opportunity of being able to share the message that is upon my heart with you this morning. God's blessing upon you and upon your house.